flame buckets repair work underway at Massey's static fire stand, Booster 16 has its flight termination system installed at the Rocket Garden, rebar work underway for the new Gigabay at the build site, and Pad 1 OLM is finally being prepared for Flight 10. Hey everyone and welcome to RGV Aerial Photography's Starbase Flyover Update number 94. We have another fantastic flyover this week, it took place on August 14th at an altitude of 6,000 feet, and captured all the fast moving action here at Starbase Texas. My name's Jeff A, and I'll be your guide today, so let's kick back and take in all the exciting sights. We'll also catch up with a summary of all the news from SpaceX regarding Flight 9 events, the upcoming Flight 10, and the Ship 36 static fire attempt anomaly. But before that, let's start over at the Massey's test facility. Here's a labelled map from Brocky to find your way around the site. Beginning at the flame trench, we can see welding work on the flame bucket, and this confirms that it did sustain damage during the Ship 36 anomaly. Moving to the right, we can see a large pad for what is speculated to be a fluids bunker. Additional wall sections for the trench have been poured. Next to the horizontal methane tank, we see foam work for the six vaporizers sitting on the other side of the trench as well as a circular embed for the vertical tank sitting on its side to the left. The framework for the methane pump housing has been installed. To the right, the two methane vertical tanks have been rotated 90 degrees. At the lock subcoolers, modifications are being made to the pre-existing nitrogen exhaust manifolds. Now moving to the booster cryostand, we can see the updated locator pins on the different triangular legs. Also, the two quick disconnects have been installed on the QD frame. Underneath them, we can see the rails that they will use to move on. The new pad between the nitrogen and LOX tanks has been poured. The embeds now seem to be more compatible with transport stands, so it's unclear what purpose this serves, or if the old crusher may still be stored or used here. Next to the old crusher base, a previously used segment has reappeared and may be reintegrated. Finally, at B-13's aft section, additional engines have been removed as the scrapping of this section continues. Now let's move over to Sanchez, shall we? Here's a map of both the build site and Sanchez to get yourself familiar with all the areas of interest. Starting with the speculated breakover feature, two out of four rams have been lifted into place. Remember that this structure could enable turning the vehicle sideways for horizontal transport. Let's see how it develops in the coming weeks. At the Booster version 3 transport stand, the clamps have been installed on each hold-down arm, with just the alignment balls missing on top of these. To the side, more work stands and nose cone jigs are being built, with parts staged for more. Star Factory will be filled to the brim with work stands. Moving to the black and white structures, one of them has grown to three floors and has the outer platforms folded in. The current speculation around these is that they will be to work on ring sections, the three-floor version for quads, and the two-floor version for the three-ring barrel sections, but we'll keep an eye out on them. Next to the legs on the new static fire stand gantry at Massey's, a new platform has joined them. This seems to be related, possibly for the QD panel to be mounted on. Rolling to the ship quick disconnect arm, progress is seen with employees working on its plumbing. Also to the side, there are two relatively new torque rods for the chopsticks landing rail. Could these be to replace the current ones at Pad 2? Or for the future revamp sticks for Pad 1? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, here we have two manifolds for subcoolers, most likely for the lock side at Massey's. There are two larger diameter pipes here that resemble a set of two under the new methane tanks at the launch site, and may be part of the Massey's methane system. Now switching to the former gas power plant, two new Tesla Mega Packs have been delivered for installation. At the scrapyard, we have SN2 that was moved here as mentioned in the previous flyover. Let's see what happens to it, the next oldest thing left at Starbase after Hoppy. Finally, B-16 had its flight termination system installed on the 17th. By the next episode, it might be in the Gulf, if all goes well. Just before moving on to the build site, we'd like to thank all of our YouTube and Patreon members. Remember, all of the Patreons get to participate in our Discord show and tell sessions on the same day of each flight. Here you can join in the discussions and ask your own questions. YouTube members also get to watch and listen in with a live chat function. Starting off at the Gigabay, work has begun to tying the pilings to rebar for the perimeter pile cap. 
This design mirrors that of the Roberts Road Gigabay in Florida. Let's now take a look at Megabay 2, home to ship 37 and 38. We can see the empty centre workstation in one of the clearest views we've had for a while. Ship 37 returned to the bay on August 14th after undergoing additional spin prime testing at the launch site. There have been no notable changes with Ship 38 or Megabay 1. Now moving to the Star Factory, we can see in this ground photo by Starship Gazer that Ship 39 has been stacked onto its payload bay. As a reminder, this will be the first Block 3 ship. A few new design changes we've observed to this nose cone are the relocation of the catch points. They are now on the nose cone instead of the payload bay. Also, the Starlink antennas just above have moved slightly windward and a new hole with unknown purpose is seen near the flap hinge. In the space previously occupied by Tent 4, a new area with a short retention wall has been constructed. A trench is being filled in the direction of the methane tanker trailer, possibly indicating a permanent methane tank may be placed here. Behind the Star Factory, we can see a Dragon Skywalker, with the exact same design used on Polaris Dawn's mission where Jared Isaacman emerged from Crew Dragon on an EVA. This is likely a replica to allow Starbase employees to pose for photos. Finally, at the multi-storey apartment building, we've seen further progress at this corner, with the crane lifting concrete sections to form the elevator shaft, stairwell, and the start of several rooms. Before moving on to the launch site, make sure to give the video a like if you haven't already, and subscribe to our channel if you've learned something from this video. Help us reach our target of 80,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Here's this week's labelled map. Take a moment to pause the video if you need extra time looking it over. Starting at Pad 2, the concrete to the west of the trench is poured. Just below, the strip along the property line is prepared and was poured the following day. At the base of the ground support equipment bunker, the first panel of cladding has been installed. On both sides of the centre section, the beams have been prepared with paint ground away prior to welding. Just to the right, some concrete has been removed around bolt embeds for the first level beams for the wing. Along the edge of the trench ramp, plates of curved steel are being installed to smooth the connecting surface between the trench walls and ramp. At the bottom of the trench, sump pumps are being installed. Near the retention pond, the pump for the west sump pit is staged as well as a pipe assembly for connecting it to the pipe already installed. To the north of the flame trench, work on the lift pad has taken a turn. The formwork has been removed from two sides and all the embed plates have been shifted seems the initial survey for their placement was done inaccurately. At the fluids bunker, the methane and LOX supply pipes are connected to the tower with the methane return still to be connected. At the end of the large bank of water tanks, the FireX supply pipes have been disconnected in preparation for tank installation. A 24 axle SPMT was seen making its way to the launch site, indicating the tank may be arriving soon. The final valves have been installed in nitrogen vents for the first two sections of water deluge pressurisation. Late on Friday the 15th, the first tests of the gas generators would be conducted. Thanks to this clip from Lab Padre, we can see the high pressure venting of nitrogen for what appeared to be one of the vents for the bank of large tanks. Most of the steel for phase one of the mega bunker is assembled and roof sheets are being placed. At the back of the Pad 2 pump farm, the pipe work for the lock side into the main trench is now complete, with the small segments left out for testing now installed. Next to the lock hippos, two additional tall vaporizers have been installed. Interestingly, these didn't come from the Highway 4 storage lot, as they have a different structural reinforcement. Further down the tank farm, a fourth vaporizer has also been installed here. At Pad 1, Ship 37 is left, following the 6-engine spin prime test to validate the RVAC that was swapped. In this shot, the LR11000 has been connected to the ship adapter ring for removal. Over the weekend, the makeshift ship quick disconnect structure would also be removed, and the 20 sets of hold-down clamps would be lifted into the launch mount. On August 15th, SpaceX released information related to Flight 9 and the Ship 36 anomaly. They also announced a Flight 10 test date no earlier than August 24th, with the launch window opening at 6.30pm Central Time. With no vehicles at the pad as of the writing of this episode, it looks like there may be a slip in that launch schedule. 
For the full report, check out the SpaceX website, but to summarise, Booster 14 performed as expected on its ascent and boost back burn. As it approached a soft water landing in the Gulf, the higher angle of attack initiated to test the limits of the booster's return resulted in structural damage to the methane transfer tube that ultimately caused the booster to experience a rapid disassembly near the beginning of the landing burn. Ship 35 reached Seco, however five minutes into the burn, methane was detected in the nose cone, presumably from hardware associated with the autogenous pressurisation located at the top of the forward dome. The elevated pressure in the nose cone coupled with planned venting resulted in a loss of attitude control for the remainder of the flight. The ship activated automatic passivation to prepare for an uncontrolled re-entry, which remained within the flight's launch corridor. The report goes on to mention Ship 36, while it was preparing to fly on Flight 10, experienced an anomaly on the Massey's static fire stand during its six-engine static fire attempt. The report confirmed that the anomaly was caused by the failure of one of the COPVs in the nose cone due to damage that went unnoticed. We'll be keeping an eye on the City of Starbase website for upcoming transport delays and testing closures as we await the next flight test. Before we sign off, Construction continues at the site of the Air Separation Unit, or ASU. The drill rig now has a boom vertical with auger sections nearby for installation. Foundation work is moving quickly, with new formwork set and rebar being assembled along the perimeter of the site. Well, that's it for episode 94 of Starbase Flyover Update. Thank you for choosing to fly with RGV Aerial Photography, and we hope you all enjoyed the flight. If you liked what you saw today, please subscribe for more episodes and content so you don't miss out on the new videos each week. I'm Jeff A, and we hope to see you again from 6,000 feet.